So we are going to kick things off with a foreign policy discussion it's called Breakfast with Bogdan, Crossroads or Roundabout, American Foreign Policy at a Critical Juncture. You met him last night as one of our new Tony Blankley Fellows. Dr. George Bogdan is a George F. Kennan Fellow at the Kennan Institute, and he is also a Strategy and Policy Fellow funded by the Smith Richardson Foundation, a, visiting, a senior visiting researcher at Brad College, and an Olin Fellow at Columbia Law School. His knowledge and experience in foreign policy is extensive, so you are in for a treat with everything going on in the world today. Please welcome George Bogdan. Thank you, uh, Haley, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and I have to thank, again, the Steamboat Institute, all of its generous supporters, and its volunteers. Um, I really appreciate your dedication to America's first principles and to the defense of liberty. Everyone in this room believes that America is exceptional. And it is, by definition. There's never been a place like it in human history. And so the Steamboat Institute's work to honor and to perpetuate that historical reality puts all of you in a category different than any other in history. You know, in the frontier days, pioneers headed west along trails not far from where we're gathered. And often, they would keep campfires lit throughout the night for safety and to keep the wolves away. The members and supporters of the Steamboat Institute, I would argue, do the same today. In your defense of our American experiment, you are the keepers of that fire. And just like the old days, my guess is that more than just a few of you keep the Winchester near at hand. In all seriousness, though, it's a great personal honor for me to be here today at the Freedom Conference. I note that we're 8,100 feet above sea level this morning and for a kid from Hawaii, that's a big deal. Uh, if anything that I say nauseates you this morning, I'm going to blame the altitude. <laughs> In your charity, uh, I do invite your prayers to the people of my home state because they're suffering from more than just wildfires, awful as they are. They're suffering from the neglect of the federal government. Having grown up in the state, I'll tell you the dangers were present long before the first sparks flew. And when we look at the international arena, our government is guilty of neglect there too. The Biden administration is mismanaging other grave dangers. And in international affairs, just as in Hawaii, there's a risk of wildfire. This morning, I'd like to talk about how to prevent it. In technical terms, I'd like to talk about deterrence. Now, I imagine most of us in this room would probably call deterrence common sense. But I'll briefly share some thoughts on how we came to this point. I'll then offer a snapshot of the dangers in the international landscape today. And lastly, I'll offer some thoughts about where we should go from here. I'll say up front, our current trajectory is not a good one though there is still time to take a different trail. Now, I mentioned that I grew up in Hawaii. Not far from my childhood home, there's a place where I used to go to watch oil gurgle up from the seafloor. It comes from the wreckage of the USS Arizona. It still leaks after all these years. And if you go there today, you can see it through the memorials opening in the floor overlooking that ship's sunken decks. Though through its solemnity and commemoration, Pearl Harbor is an image of what happens when deterrence fails. So is Ukraine. From the end of World War II up until the early 1990s, American statesmen mostly understood the need for deterrence. They argued about how best to achieve it, about how best to implement it, but whether they were Republican or Democrat, they generally believed in its value. That changed in the early 1990s. I won't go into all of the academic detail, 
but I've spent a lot of time researching newly released documents from the Clinton administration's archives, specifically those surrounding the so-called Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances, which was signed in 1994. If you're not familiar, this is the agreement by which Ukraine, formerly part of the Soviet Union, agreed to give up its share of, old, of the old Soviet nuclear arsenal after great pressure from the United States and Russia. In exchange, Ukraine was given a pie crust promise of security from the West, a promise that was easily made and more easily broken. According to their own records, President Clinton's team knew that Russia harbored designs to one day treat Ukraine as a province beyond an illusory border. At one point, before basically forcing Ukraine's hand, Ambassador Strobe Talbot asked then Secretary of State Warren Christopher, what if reality doesn't follow the script that we're writing for it? What if Russia invades Ukraine? But the best that they believe they could do was to just encourage the Russians and the Ukrainians to, quote, work towards solving their differences, end quote. The Clinton administration basically forced Ukraine to hand over its potential nuclear arsenal anyway. It is hard to guard your camp if you hand over the Winchester. And Ukraine and the world, I would say, are now seeing the consequences. But here's another example, one that I think is more familiar to all of us in the room. This month is the second anniversary of America's exit from Afghanistan. That was President Biden's rout heard around the world. At the time, eminent international relations historian and my former professor, Walter Russell Mead, observed, from the peaks of Pakistan to the sands of the Sahel, fanatical jihadists discouraged by the failure of ISIS sense a fresh and favorable turn of events with the arrival of their greatest victory since 9-11. But it wasn't just a win for the Taliban. As Mead also said at the time, revisionist powers surely interpreted the shambolic performance as a sign of exploitable weakness and of poor judgment. They did. That botched withdrawal was President Putin's green light. Some in this room might recall how Russian leaders suffered a similar defeat in Afghanistan in 1989. Some of those same leaders saw the US withdrawal in 2021 as a moment of opportunity, as a sign of weakness. They seized it and they invaded Ukraine. And now for all the tax taxpayer dollars sent to Ukraine, for all of the weapons sent to Ukraine, the Biden administration has not managed to bring about anything more than a bloody stalemate. That stalemate is not just the product of failed deterrence. It's also the result of an ongoing flawed process whereby a fire hose of aid has been allotted in a trickle. Drips and drabs predictably do not produce decisive victory. We are behind the pace and the, and the proportion of defense spending sent to Kiev provided by less affluent allies. Somehow Poland understands better than we do that this extends the war. It increases its cost and it exacerbates the dynamics that the Biden administration seeks to avoid. I submit to you that we are here because the current administration is making the same mistakes that the Clinton administration made 30 years ago. They do not understand deterrence. The Biden administration's foreign policy architects, Secretary Blinken et al., aren't behaving like architects at all. They're not planning and building appropriately. They're behaving more like writers of a script for a television show. But unlike their comrades currently on strike in Hollywood, the characters they deal with don't do what you want them to do. 
It's hard to have a happy ending, I would say, if the villains refuse to follow the plot line. When I say that, I often get pushed back from the foreign policy blob full of many of my friends and colleagues. They say, really, come on, George. This stuff is extraordinarily complex. Give them more grace than that. Yes, foreign policy is extremely complex. And like the weather, it changes by the hour. But if you go a bit deeper than the surface level, there are some constants, I would say. There are some basics that we can observe. There are certain realities that you cannot solve or wish away by tweaking things at the surface. You see, underneath, there are something like tectonic plates in foreign policy, and they are much more defined. They have fault lines. There are areas of friction. Sometimes one slips and gets pushed under, and others rise. As with the Earth, tectonic plates of international relations obey certain rules. They respond to pressure or the lack of it. In international relations, as in geology, these tectonic plates often move very slowly. But sometimes, they do move all at once. Earthquake. In international affairs, we call earthquakes war. The way you prevent that phenomenon is deterrence. But in order for deterrence to work, you need to read the right warning signs. The Biden administration either cannot or will not do this. Someone said the difference between saber rattling and actually drawing a saber is that one makes a lot of noise and one makes hardly any at all. And how do you distinguish between the two? I would say you have to look at those deeper realities that I just mentioned. Not what you hope to see, as the Clinton administration did in the 1990s. Not what you want to see, as the Biden administration does now, when it tells us all the war is not in a stalemate in Ukraine. You really need to look with the right lens. So how should we see the world today? What lens should we take? The ancient Greek historian Thucydides said nations often go to war for three reasons. Fear, honor, and interest. And often, they act because of a combination of those three. When we look around the world today, we see Russia's invasion of Ukraine really hits all three of those. But let's look at an even gloomier picture, the Indo-Pacific. Xi Jinping has effectively made himself president for life of China. Another term for that might be emperor. The Chinese Communist Party is the most re well-resourced, the most strategic thinking, and the most dangerous threat to the United States. I would go so far as to say it is an existential threat. Not just because of its lavish military investments over the last decade, Investments, I might add, which have come as the United States' military force has declined, but because the CCP has the power to capture America's elites and the institutions that they govern. In propping up Russia, the CCP is acting on its interest. They seek to support a fellow revisionist power in challenging the global order led by America. China undermines and co-ops global institutions from the UN to the World Health Organization. Beijing blasts the Western rules-based order. They call it biased and ineffective. It touts China's authoritarian model around the world, and it trains others in it, from Southeast Asia to Africa to Central America. Where in the world, I ask, is the Biden administration championing the US model? the one of checks and balances, the one of rule of law, the one of majority rule but minority rights. Like Russia and Ukraine, we see China trying to assess whether it has a moment of opportunity on Taiwan, a window of time to act on its national honor.
For the CCP, Taiwan has always been a part of China. They cannot be whole unless they control it the same way that they control Hong Kong. And as for fear, when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party, who do they fear? Do they think President Biden and his administration are worthy of their fear? Hardly. If anyone, they fear their own hundreds of millions of people, many of whom are facing declining economic prospects. Either way, that is not deterrence. And this brings me to the last region that I'd like to discuss with you this morning and where I want to point out grave dangers. It is not thousands of miles away. It's Washington, D.C. It's how the Biden administration is failing to respond to these dangers. Let's go back to Thucydides. Nations act on fear, honor, and interest. The Biden administration isn't acting on any of these. Let's look at fear, which I must first distinguish from panic, because the Biden folks are no strangers to panic in foreign policy. The president has already evacuated six embassies since he came into office. That's twice the number of his predecessor. Kabul, where he stranded thousands, was his first. Protecting the lives of American diplomats is an honorable choice, of course. No one wants to repeat the terrible mistakes made by Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton in Benghazi. But Mr. Biden has become the evacuator in chief because he allows that decision to become a necessity again and again. Panic is born of failed preemption. Panic is the price of failing to fear a patient and vindictive adversary. You have to wonder which embassy Biden will evacuate next. It's probably one in East Asia, I would say. And the Biden foreign policy elites should be afraid of what China is doing. I don't just mean 8,000 miles away in the South China Sea, where China's three to two advantage in fifth generation fighters and a massive network of land-based missiles can destroy virtually any US aircraft or surface ships within 4,000 kilometers of China's mainland. I don't just mean that the Biden, that the Biden administration and its team should be afraid of what China is doing in our backyard in Central and Latin America. In that region, the CCP is buying foreign governments and installing intelligence collection facilities to spy on us here in the United States. No, I mean that the Biden administration should be afraid of what China is literally doing in our front yard, where they're buying up farmland around strategic air and missile silos in our heartland, where they're flying spy balloons with impunity over those same sites and the homes of million Amer millions of American citizens. But I also mean in New York City, where they're installing covert police forces to harass, to intimidate, and to arrest Chinese American citizens on US soil for thought crimes that are challenging party leaders back in Beijing. But the Biden administration doesn't seem to have a healthy fear of any of this. Just like they have no fear that our only edge in deterring war over Taiwan is our submarine force. But that maintenance of those issues, but excuse me, but maintenance issues and production delays have shrunk in that fleet to three fifths the size that the Navy requires. And I was shocked to learn that the Congressional Research Service has determined that the US Navy has just 31 submarines operationally ready to service worldwide. What was once the envy of the world has now withered. Team Biden should be very afraid, but they aren't. What about honor? The Biden foreign policy elites do not act with America's national honor in, interest, in, in, in mind. Look at that Afghanistan withdrawal that I spoke about just a few minutes ago. Who remembers the images of those people clinging to the wheel wells of the C-17? I place no fault on America's service members. Blame belongs on the president and his national security team. The quote 
adults in the room, end quote, callously disregarded what, was, what a shock to American prestige of that magnitude would trigger in every corner of the world, from Kosovo to Kaifeng Bay. And lastly, we are not currently acting in our national interest. Like President Clinton in the 1990s, we are not seeing the world as it is. What would we do if we were? We would be clear-eyed, hard-nosed, and unapologetic about protecting American interests in the world. We'd invest in the way that we need to on everything from submarines to AI. We'd support our friends, with whom we often disagree, like India, against adversaries like China that resolve disagreements with domination. We'd find common ground with non-government, excuse me, with non-great powers, with what some call the in-betweeners, and we would win those countries over. I'm talking now about countries like Hungary. Our current ambassador in Budapest spends more time explaining why his pronoun is ambassador than he does advancing American security interests in Europe. Hungary is a NATO ally, and yet we've estranged them to the point of near alienation. Rather than choosing battles to fight, the Biden administration has satisfied itself with canceling governments that have grievances, rather than taking them seriously. Singapore is another example. The US has excluded both Singapore and Hungary from its much vaunted summit for democracy. Meanwhile, China is wooing both. And they're not the only ones. If America were acting in its best interests, we'd engage in unpleasant deal-making now to save lives, not just American lives, but the lives of others tomorrow. The lack of deterrence today leads to disaster in the long term. Now, I said earlier that our trajectory is a bad one, but I, but I also said that there's time to take a different trail. There is time, I would argue, to pick up the tool of deterrence. Look, it's a grim time. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But I, I have to say that while I have very little faith in the foreign policy elites of the United States, I have plenty of faith in the American people. To go back to what I said at the beginning, this is an exceptional country. No doubt we have challenges today. They are complex and they are terribly sophisticated, but they are not beyond our ability to manage and eventually to overcome. If we as a people remember to look at the reality of things, the tectonic plates that I mentioned, far beneath the changing weather patterns of the news, then we will see the playing field as it truly is. And if we do that, we'll summon the will and courage to act upon our rightly ordered fear, honor, and interest. We will take up the tool of deterrence once more. And if you'll permit me some optimism, I think that tool will feel familiar in our hands, like those old pioneers keeping watch around the fire late at night with the Winchester. Thank you so much.